Condoning or judging, which should we be more afraid of? Um, I'm quite excited for this. I think it sounds, um, sounds very interesting. Do you want to um, just tell us a little bit about kind of why we're doing this question and yeah, why we're asking this and kind of what we're going to look at? Okay, well, I think we're asked, uh, in my head, it, it, part, it arose in, in the kind of main thing because it was asked a similar question last time yep. when, when Deb and I um, were, were talking about turning the other cheek and uh, I didn't feel I answered it. And, I, and what often happens is that uh, uh, Sunday night I go through all the things I should have said and all the things I shouldn't have said. And this question just kept coming backwards and forwards in my head over the last three or four weeks. Uh, so that's the first reason. The second reason is because I am aware so many people talk to me about dilemmas. Dilemmas about family, dilemmas about things going on in the workplace, dilemmas about relationships. When you just feel, when people feel, well, what should I do when my family member is doing this, or my friend is doing this, or my colleague thinks this. When do I say something? When do I not say something? And, and, and it, it, it's, I feel it's an issue for many, many, many of us. Unless we're completely clear in our mind, in which case it's just an issue for the people who have to live with us. <laughs> Because it's, it's tricky. And, and the third area of it, and I was, we were talking about this this week in a conversation, is that over the years, I'm aware that people have got quite, have found me difficult. Oh, well, just stop there. People find me difficult. But found me difficult for both reasons. So I have had a, a number of times when people feel I am condoning things that are wrong. And I've had people in the church feel very cross that I've judged situations and made judgments. And so in my own life, I feel it's very difficult to win because there are times when people feel I've made a decision about who might be on the platform, who might be able to work with children, who might even be allowed to go to small groups, or who might be allowed even to come into our premises. And I'm, I had to make those decisions, and that's deemed as judgmental. But then if I don't make those decisions and we welcome and allow people to join in with us as a church that others feel uneasy about. So I, I'm aware that even in my own behaviour and my, the perception that people have. So uh, that's really why I thought it might be a good question because I just didn't think I answered it well last time. I think it's a great question. Um, so have you got some scriptures that yeah. you want to go through before we get started? Well, I've got, I've got several. We'll, we'll, we'll come backwards and forwards if, if we're seeing the yeah. one. But I do want to start with Jesus because this, this story seems to... that You can't find the word condone in the Bible. You can find the word judge quite a lot. And that in itself tells us something. But you can't find the word condone. But this is the nearest moment, I think where people accuse Jesus of condoning something. So you're going into uh, Jericho, and uh, it says, uh, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, some of us go, oh, I know this story, but I do want to help you just look at it a little bit more closely. For those of you who don't really understand this story, just it's really important to understand the context. Judah at this time, Jerusalem at this time, is occupied. It is occupied by a brutal regime. Um, I guess the nearest we might get to it is, is, is elements of Crimea or Ukraine that have been taken over. It is occupied. There are soldiers on the street corners. That's part of what we looked at last time of turning the other cheek. And they, they, they took money off the people. They collected taxes. But they didn't use Romans to collect the taxes. They used people of Judah who were prepared to collaborate mm -hmm and who were prepared to work for the Romans. So these people were traitors. And they got rich doing it because they were allowed to charge whatever they had to give the Romans, a certain amount, but they could charge as much on top of that. They would have soldiers with them to help collect the taxes. Mm. They were bullies. They were uh, traitors. So, it, you know, it's, uh, if you imagine that 
there were Ukrainians who choose to get rich by helping the Russians. I guess that's the nearest we can kind of imagine it. So the people despise these guys, absolutely despise these guys. And so we come across this guy called Zacchaeus, and uh, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But he was, a, he was short. I love this little detail. He was a little man. He was a short guy, and he couldn't see over the crowd. Now, of course, the crowd don't like him, so they're not making room for him. You know, they're not saying, oh, Zacchaeus, come to the front because you're only little. Mm-hmm. They're saying, you yeah, know, tough, tough mate. So uh, perhaps you've done it in Sunday school. He runs ahead and he climbs a tree, a sycamore fig tree, to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. Now, again, we need to understand the culture and the context. If you go and eat with someone or you go to somebody's house, in many cultures today and in that culture uh, especially, you are showing an equality and an acceptance. You are saying, you're a friend of mine. And it's quite clear, Jesus hasn't told him off for being a collaborator. He hasn't told him off for exploiting the poor. He's just saying, I'm going to come to your house. And that is the point at which the crowd and the people... Well, it says he came down at once and welcomed them gladly. He's going, well, crikey, (laughs) this guy, Jesus, thinks I'm okay. He thinks I'm all right. He's going to come into my house. But that's the last straw for the people who saw this. They've begun to mutter. That's the nearest we can get to the word condone. He's gone to the, be the guest of a sinner. And elsewhere, there are a number of times where the, the insult and the accusation of Jesus is that he was a friend of sinners. But they are, they are really saying, you are condoning this guy. You are not telling him that he is mistreating God's people. He is disobedient to God's chosen people. He's living in rebellion against God because he's put money as his idol. And Jesus hasn't told him off. He says, I'm going to come Now, it's a little unclear as to whether he then goes in or whether before he even gets in, what we do know is that Jesus doesn't say anything now. But Zacchaeus says something. Zacchaeus stood up. Now, whether he's stood up in front of Jesus in the house, whether he's come back out, because the, 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 the previous verse said he has gone. So the people have said, look, he's gone in there. So does Zacchaeus come out or does Zacchaeus say something to Jesus we're not quite sure, but what we do know is that we don't, we're not, it's not recorded that Jesus has told him off. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and I've, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times this amount. So Zacchaeus is changed. He acknowledges and recognizes he's done something wrong, and he wants to put it right. And it appears not to be as a result of Jesus' rebuke. It appears to be as a result of Jesus' acceptance. It's not that Jesus tells him he's doing the right thing. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't tell him he's doing right or wrong. He just tells him you are a, a valuable person. And that seems to change the Zacchaeus. So there doesn't seem to be a rebuke, in, at least in the way Luke is telling us. And that's consistent with uh, some of the other encounters that Jesus has uh, and why they, they mutter about him as a friend of sinners. And then, and then Jesus uh, says to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. This man is a true man of the people of God, a son of Abraham. Not because of what he's done in exploiting and and being a collaborator and being a sinner, but in his response, in his repentance. 
because the Son of Man came, that's the way Jesus describes himself, he came to look for, to fight, to, 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 to uh, intentionally seek out people who were doing the wrong thing, the people who were lost. And so, and that's been a fundamental question for me over, over the last few years, particularly, particularly in terms of the food bank, in terms of how we relate to people. Uh, and, and it's, what is the most effective way to bring people to repentance? The, the, the thing is that, that Zacchaeus repents. We want people to change. We want people to change their lifestyle or change their values or change their attitudes and to come into a line with God's purposes. We want that. The question is what causes that? We might come back to that question if you want, but we'll... we'll, we'll... Absolutely. Got loads of things ringing around. Loads of questions ringing around. I had a question come in, but we'll ask that a little bit later on. So I'm thinking practically then today, what does this look like in your mind for a Christian? So in terms of condoning or, or being out and about with people, how does that look? Do you think? Well, I think, I think that let's, let's, what does condoning mean? Mm. I think there is a difference between how con, 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 condoning is, dis, is feared and what it actually is. Mm. Condoning is saying to someone, I am encouraging you in a behavior that is bad. Mm. And clearly, that is not how we want to live our lives. We do not want to encourage people to do things that are damaging to them. But the question for me is, is silence the same as condoning? Mm. And I'm not sure that it is. And most of the time I'm accused of condoning. It's not because I've said to somebody, you're doing the right thing. It's simply because I've been a friend. Mm. I've been a friend to someone, a friend to a sinner. So I think sometimes we conflate, conflate, confuse, mix up, the difference between being a friend and condoning. And I think that we need to find some way, a pathway. And what it looks like is tricky in every situation. Mm. Because, and we've all got to follow the sense in which God leads us. And there are times when we do need to say something. And there are times when silence, I think, is okay. This is one of those moments where Jesus doesn't. Mm. Ben, can you just mute that slide because I want to go and, and look at another slide and I'm going to forward through something if I may. So if you can just take me off, that's great. Okay, yeah. So uh, the, the, the question for me is how, what brings people to repentance? Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that fundamentally that is an encounter with God's Holy Spirit. Mm. It's fundamentally God that changes a person's life. And that that is something that we need to give space and facility for God to do rather than us do. Mm. So I, what does that look like? I think that, and I might be wrong on this, I probably am, but it seems to me that uh, the, 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 the first thing we do is, is we pray. Before we start throwing around our comments and our views and what we think is right and wrong, let's pray for people. Mm. Jesus clearly knew what Zacchaeus was like. He clear, you know, we believe that Jesus knew all things. He, he, I imagine that Jesus had been praying, I, but we pray for people to be transformed. Mm. So much of what we need God to do, we need God to do it, not us. Mm. So I think we pray for people. I think the second thing is that I've, I've come to believe that preach that the Bible changes people more than my words. Mm. That we want to bring, enable people to hear Scripture and let Scripture transform people. Um, that may be 
that may be in a service, that may be preaching, it may be as I unpack or others on the platform unpack what scripture is teaching. People are challenged and people go, that needs, that changes my life. But that, in my view, is far more effective than me saying out the door as you go out, by the way, I think you need to do this, you know. Because I guarantee we're all sinners in this room. Mm. And I don't think it's going to be helpful if before you leave I tell you all the things you're doing wrong. (laughs) (laughs) But I hope that as we proclaim scripture in a way that is not our choosing to say this to someone, it's just letting God speak. Mm. So I think one of the things we want to do is pray. Firstly, we pray for people. Secondly, we try and enable them to be in a place where they can, they can hear Scripture. Uh, I'll just I th- ask a question on that, sorry. Go on. So, again, I'm just thinking practically. So a lot of situations that we might find ourselves in with non-Christians or, so let's take, for example, being going into the office to work. What does that then look like <clears throat> practically? Is that praying on the way to work? before you get into the office and then asking God, right, Holy Spirit, I want you to move through me today, simply like that? Or is it in the moment? How are you, when you're saying that, how are you imagining that look? Imagine all, that of the, all of the above. Yeah. And I think it's praying, Lord, how can I be a friend mm. that changes people? Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things we talk about here is the value of invitation as opposed to the value of us having all the answers. Mm. Bring people into God's presence in church and then let the Holy Spirit transform people. And I think the other thing that fits into that is we just encourage people to, through our own testimony, and we encourage people to be open to God. Mm. So God's changed. So our story of how God has transformed us, our story of how God has made a difference, and we model a different lifestyle. Mm. We live a different way. Mm. So condoning to me would be if we join in. Mm. But we just live differently. We don't have to tell people we're living differently. People will spot that. But we graciously and gently live such a way that people say, well, why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? We may, we will, many of us will have family members who make choices that we wish they hadn't. It's going to come, Sam. It's part of being a parent. (laughs) It's hard. Mm. But we live our godly life as much as we're able and we love and we befriend and we don't encourage. But we don't have to point things out. And the reason I say all of this is that my, my, it may just be the British culture, but I think when you tell somebody they're doing the wrong thing, A, they never change, B, they never speak to you again. Mm. That's the truth. That's, 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 I think that's how our culture works, and maybe Mm. how all human beings work. And Jesus doesn't tell Zacchaeus he's doing the wrong thing. Mm. He changes him in a different way. He changes him by friendship. So going back to, again, Silence, and you've just said there that condoning is what well, I can't remember the, word, the exact words you use now, but by being part of it. I think actively involved in joining in saying this is a good thing, guys, let's all do this together. So let me just give you an example then. So you're out and about, you're either having a meal with friends or a drink, or you're in the office again, or whatever it is. Somebody makes a joke, you think, oh, not really sure that was very funny, or that was kind of everybody else is laughing. You don't laugh. Is laughing joining in with that? Because I think we've all been in situations where we've had people who around us have said things that we wouldn't necessarily say ourselves or don't feel we would agree with. But I'm just, yeah, just using that example of a joke. I'm just yeah. trying to think really practically, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I, it, it, there, there is a both cases might be right. Mm. I, I certainly think, I mean, some of the problem is we might laugh even though we don't find it funny because mm. the, we're sinful and we just suddenly join it. And laughter's infectious, isn't it? People just yeah, laugh, people yeah, laugh. But it's I think prob- it's just, you get caught up in yeah. a moment where you think, I really should not have laughed at yes, that. Do yes. you know what I mean? I do. Happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think ideally we don't laugh. Mm. I think ideally we don't laugh. I think if that joke is at the expense of somebody else in that room, mm. I think we should say something. Directly to the person that said something, yeah. Like if, it, if it's damaging somebody else. If it's damaging somebody else, else, else yeah, this is where I think there is a, 
us where we have to step in to protect, yeah. which is where I get accused of just judging is when yeah. I'm trying to protect people. I think if if there is somebody about who that whom that is about who is there, yeah. you know, it's 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 sexist or it's racist mm. or it's just bullying yeah. called banter. That, I was just about to say that because I think being involved in youth, particularly at the older end, that's one of the hardest things is mm. distinguishing banter from when it then gets to that point where it's not banter anymore and it's it's just bullying and it's just hurtful. And I think that's something that is really quite hard to, t to draw yeah. the line on sometimes, isn't it? And I think yeah. everybody has to be able to laugh at themselves. Everybody mm. has to be able to poke fun at themselves. But there does become a point when either the joke is always on one person or just goes a bit too far and I think as youth worker you know in that situation it's very easy for me to say that wasn't very nice was it mm -hmm. apologize mm. harder in a group of friends or a group of colleagues to say oh that wasn't although we should do it it's just harder isn't it it's, yeah in well I, I, you've got to we've got to the goal is to lead people to repentance mm. the goal is not that we have felt good because we yeah. stood up for the goal is to bring change so maybe that there's, a, there's maybe the situation you say guys i don't i don't, I don't think that's fair yeah. or i don't think that's right it may be that the appropriate thing is to chat with the individual who was saying that afterwards quietly just say, i'm not comfortable with that it may be that the appropriate thing is to is, is to trust step in and pointedly change the subject i don't know every situation is mm. different but I, I think the principle for me is if somebody in the room is being hurt, we need mm. to do something. Yeah. I personally wouldn't step in because people are being cruel about, about God. Mm. I would just not laugh. I would just put, that's my own, we'll come to different decisions. Because what you don't want to do is be, well, you're never in the room, you're never invited, you're never part of things yeah. because you're the one that always criticises. So yeah. it's just finding that balance somewhere. And what you find, I think, when you stand up for people as well, isn't it, is there's probably five or six people in the room that felt exactly the same way. Mm. And actually, when you've then been the one to stand up, yeah. then they respect that, don't they? I was just thinking, I mean, just going back to you talking about being a friend as well, because I think that's really important I've just been reminded of a situation that I had with a friend of mine um, when I was growing up so I was really sort of early in my faith and I got a friend at school who was um, quite a sort of serious atheist and by that I mean well read and very kind of into having debates about things and all of that and we used to have discussions all the time and there was one night when we both went out just the two of us and we were hanging out and I remember we got into this really deep discussion and um, we argued for about an hour and a half probably and I can remember being really angry and really upset by some of the things that he'd said that were quite hurtful to me, hurtful about God, hurtful about people that I was around and I got really, really annoyed and said some hurtful things back um, which probably wasn't the best thing to do in the scenario and I remember saying to him at the end of the night, I remember saying, I just feel sorry for you um, and what I meant by that, I think, <laughs> was that I, w I wanted him to have the things that I have in my life, but he couldn't see that. And that saying, I feel sorry for you, was literally the worst thing I could have said ever. Um, and I remember waking up in the morning and praying because I felt rotten about it. I really didn't feel good. And I felt God very strongly say to me, I just want you to love him. I don't want you to argue with him. I just want you to love him. And um, I can remember that really specifically. And you talked about being a friend and being the type of person. So it's just, sorry, it's really came into my mind. And I remember in that moment then thinking, okay, well, that's what I'll do. And then about six months later, we were climbing Snowden together with another friend. And um, he turned around to me and he said, I was listening on Premier Christian Radio the other day, and this came up and just kind of completely came out of the blue. And I felt like that was God saying, what, now's the time for a conversation. Do, do you know what I mean? And this was kind of like God really clearly leading into that scenario. It took a long time. But I don't know. Do you know when you were just talking about being a friend and, and being that, there and doing that? Absolutely. That was a kind of like a thing for me where I was like, I thought, right, I need to fight for this and I need to argue for God's case and I need to... But in that, 
I mean, we're not Jesus, are we? So do you know what I mean? And we get things wrong and we say the wrong thing. And actually in that moment, God was just like, just love him. You can do that because I'll give you the, what you need to do that. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. The command of Jesus is to love. Mm. It's, not, it's not to rebuke. Yeah. Mm. That's, you know, and there is a place to protect, which I've, you know, I've tried to say, but in the main, the command is to love. And you know, Jesus says he didn't come into the world to condemn. Mm. So why should we be in the world condemning? Yeah. He came in the world to save. And the implication there is that saving people doesn't come through condemning them. Mm. He didn't come into the world to condemn. He came into the world to save. It's John 3.17. So we must save people through a different method mm. than condemning. Mm. Because that doesn't seem to be the method of Jesus. And it certainly doesn't seem to be working in our culture for the church. Mm. <laughs> but it is our reputation. Mm. And, and I was saying to somebody this week, you know, when I was, when, when I was a youth worker, you, you did a game of word association, mm. and you said uh, to a non-Christian, what word comes into your mind when you say Christian? 30 years ago, people in my generation, the word would have been hypocrite. Mm. That, was, that was the perception of the church. It was a perception of Christians. You say to a non-Christian, what's the first word that comes into your head when you think of, of a Christian? They would say hypocrite. Mm changed you say now what's the first word that come into your mind if you said the word Christian I think most non-Christians would say judgmental yeah. mm. so something's gone wrong mm. so just one more question before we move on because I think we're going to talk about what, what judging is and what that looks like so I just got one more question though mm. um, how afraid should we be of criticism from other Christians. So if we've been out and about mm. and we've been somewhere and we've bumped into people and they've seen us with people who are cracking jokes that are inappropriate, you know what I mean? There's drinks floating around. How afraid should we be of somebody saying, oh, you know, I saw you doing this. Is that, was that really the best place for you to be? Should you have been laughing at that joke? How afraid should we be of criticism coming from other people? Well, it... it it's, it's my life. <laughs> I don't get Chris, criticised by non-Christians. Mm. I get criticised <laughs> by Christians. And yes, I'm afraid of it. Mm. But I have to do... You know, Jesus... I, I, the bottom line is, if the criticism of me is, is a friend of sinners, I go, OK, well, at least I'm on the right side. Mm. I'm on Jesus' side. Jesus was criticised by the religious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's criticised of being a drunkard and a glutton, and do you know what I mean as well? Yeah, he clearly, so they, he was, you know clearly I mean? he was, was joining in the party, people. wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, because yeah, they said he's a drunkard and a glutton. Yeah. Although was that just their perception? Well, that's what I don't I've imagine he was wondered. drunk. I'm yeah. sure he yeah. wasn't drunk, and I'm sure he didn't overeat. But, but they they accused him of it. Associate with yeah, yes. with you being there. Yeah. That's what you must have been yeah. doing. Yeah, mm. yeah. I noticed. Uh, I noticed this week that there was some criticism of the Archbishop of Canterbury because he went to an iftar, which is the uh, meal at the end of Ramadan of a day of fasting that Muslims invite non-Muslims to. Mm. I've been to two this Ramadan, two different groups of uh, Muslims in, in, in Sutton have invited me to an iftar, and I've been. And I did think, <laughs> I've just told the church now, but I did think, well, some people in the church are going to feel I shouldn't be here. I wasn't worshipping Allah. Neither was I standing up and telling them not to do what they were doing. I was trying to be a friend. We had conversations about what I believe. We had conversations mm. about Jesus. But fundamentally, yes, I was worried. I've just blown it now by telling you all, but most of you would know I do things like that. But uh, yeah, I worry that people, in the, people will go, whoa, you, you shouldn't be there. But I have to tell myself Jesus would have been there. I know. If Jesus was going to <laughs> the kids, he would have been at the mosque like yeah, I was yeah. last week. Absolutely. And I can't tell you not to be afraid because unfortunately Christians are judgmental. Mm. That's one of our problems. Mm. We make judgments. We look at things and we think we know. And we don't. Okay, so condoning, do you want to talk about 
Do you want to move on to judging, or have you got anything else you want to say on this? Uh, yeah, no, let's talk about judging, because yes. the, 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 we use the word, and the Bible uses the word judging to mean two different, two different things. So when we talk about not judging, there are, there are two things that we do as judging. So the, the first thing that we do as judging is that we think we know what, why we determine that we know a person's motives and we know what they've done. So you say Jesus was at somebody's house, he's a drunkard and a glutton. That's a judgment that's wrong because we know Jesus wouldn't have got drunk. He was just drinking alcohol. The judgment is to say, I've seen two and I've seen two and I'm making five. And that is human nature. We do it all the time. And we know that all of us have been hurt by it. All of us have experienced other people doing it to us. But we don't know when we're doing it. Mm. And uh, that's the first element. So we need to guard against that in our lives. And the second type of judging is when we act as the judge and we pass sentence. In other words, we criticise or condemn from an attitude of superiority. Mm. Have you seen what they do? And what we're saying is their behavior is less than ours because we are the judge in a court mm. of law and we're slightly superior, we're slightly in be better. So we imply that other people deserve the punishment that they get. Um, and it arises out of a hypocritical lack of compassion. Mm. And it really, really annoys Jesus. He, he, you know, we can't find a passage where he tells people, be careful that you don't condone sin. We can find a lot of stuff about judging. And I'm gonna, I, do, I do think it's important just to, to, to read a couple of them. And this, so this word, do not judge or you too will be judged, he's, he's kind of combining the two things. But it, look what he says. He says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And then he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own? How can you say to somebody else, you are doing wrong when you are a sinner? Sometimes folks who, who, who worry about whether I condone sin accuse me of not being biblical. I often get accused of not being biblical. <laughs> we need to take this stuff literally. He says, how can you criticize somebody else when you are a sinner? And yet, that's what we do as our, in our Christian culture. Uh, and he says, you do not, he says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from the other person's eye. Now, the problem with that is some might say, well, okay, I'm now able to judge because I've removed all the sin in my life. Well, I haven't removed the sin in my life. Hmm. There are times when I need to protect people. We've talked about that. But it is not my role to go around telling people they're doing the wrong thing when I know that in my life there is stuff that I'm doing wrong. Mm. And he doubles down in Luke 6. Love your enemies, do good to them. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And I want to come back to that phrase in a moment. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. There is a lot of repetition, there is a lot of emphasis going on here. And so th this, this concept of sort of two extremes, there has to be something in the middle. And sometimes we characterize underneath these anxieties as the tension between, you know, God's love, how do we express that God is loving, and how do we express that God isn't happy with things that are going on in the world? And how do we hold those two things together? And they are difficult. You know, there is stuff in our lives that makes God angry because we hurt and damage other people. And yet he is gracious. And the middle word is mercy. So my job is to express mercy. That requires people to know they need forgiveness. 
If I'm going to be a friend of sinners, it requires people to know they're sinful. But they need my friendship. If I'm going to be merciful, that's the job. He says, don't judge, be merciful. So in the workplace, the, the joke, what does being merciful look like? Because that's the command. And that seems to me to be the question we've got to explore. And it looks different in every situation. But what does it look like to be merciful? So it's neither condoning nor judging. It's being merciful. So, but there is a level of discernment that we need. Mm. And we need to know when we're doing something wrong when somebody else is doing something wrong. So when, how, does, how do we know when we're doing stuff wrong? How do other people know when they're doing stuff wrong? And then how do, how do we discern in that? How do we well, how, how do right we? How... So this is my point. And maybe I'm the only person in the room, but 99% of the time I realise I'm doing wrong is in my quiet walk with God, and my engagement with Him in Scripture. And I look at that and go, I'm doing. I need to change that. Or I hear a sermon, or I read a book, and I hear that. All the times that other people have told me I'm doing wrong has never changed me. <laughs> just hasn't. I mean, am I, am I alone in this? It just has never changed me. It's just either made me rebelliously resistant mm. or actually they were wrong and they were judging. Yeah, it depends. So I'm, we are changed by God, not by people. Yeah, but th there is a sense in which when we get advice from people or a helpful word or something when we're not doing something. So I've been in accountability triplets or partnerships. Uh, at asking people for that's help. That's it. That's so brilliant. That's what I was going to say. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. a helpful thing, isn't oh. it? Because like, I feel like I've been in situations where I've welcomed that. I've welcomed people to be quite harsh with me. It, and that's been a very helpful thing for me. Brilliant. And I've also had people who have allowed me to, to be that. But I suppose you're talking from a perspective so of not being in that type I of relationship. I think it's a really, really healthy thing. Is to, yeah. Not everybody. Don't go around the whole world asking whether you're doing the right thing. Choose one, two people and being accountable to them is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Because we are asking for help. The point I'm making is that uh, we don't get changed by unsolicited advice. Mm. Now, there are times because we have to protect the people in the room where I have to say, you can't do that. Mm. And, and, the, and that's when I'm accused of being judgmental because I ha you have to protect. So there are times, and, and when you're a parent, there are times when you have to tell your kids you don't do that because that's unfair on your brother or that's going to hurt you or you're gro going to grow up and nobody's going to like you. Mm. So don't do that. Mm. So you have to protect. But in the main as we become adults, uh, being rebuked achieves the protection of the people we are hurting, which is important, but mm. it doesn't achieve transformation. Mm. So on that, I know we're really running out of time and so many questions have come in that we would like, well, I'd like to get through at least a few of them. So some people might say, on, on sort of everything that we've looked at so far, I know there's some other stuff that you probably want to, want to mention just before we finish, that society, 2,000 somewhat years ago, you've said it already, there's, you know, it's occupied, there's Pharisees, there's Sadducees, there's all these high up religious kind of very legalistic groups of people. Jesus is in this kind of environment where, okay, he probably needs to speak a certain way and behave a certain way and he's probably being like, okay, judgmental isn't the way to be, be like this. Then you've got people that would say today, we're a lot more along the lines of condoning as a general society. Anything goes, do whatever you want, be whoever you want, live your life, accept your truth, those types of things. Do you think Jesus would have tackled it differently had he come to earth today, well not today, but 30 years ago, and he was involved in his sort of ministry right now? No, because I don't think human nature is any different. Mm. I think there was, as much as there was a religious culture, there was also a huge amount of disobedience to the religious culture. Mm. That's why you had your tax collectors, your, your, your women, woman caught in adultery, your prostitutes who washed Jesus' feet. Or, you know, 
I don't think human nature is any different. I don't mm. think people are transformed by religious people telling them they're doing the wrong thing mm. in a one-to-one -one situation from, the, from a platform where it's, if you like, anonymous. It's my role, those of us on the platform, to teach scripture, to point out in a gracious, non-superior uh, manner what scripture is teaching, mm. but not in an individual relationship. I don't think it changes things. Mm. Okay. So, I, I, yeah, I don't, think, I don't think our society... You're right, we, we live in a culture where it says anything goes or whatever, but that was the Roman culture. I mean, worse than our culture was the Roman culture. Are you happy for me to ask you some mm -hmm. of these? Is there anything else you want to go through first? So we had somebody ask, if you feel like you've been judged unfairly, how do you move on from that personally, do you think? if you feel like people have judged you, or let's, let's ask both sides, so you feel like, firstly, you've been judged, how do you move on from that? Secondly, you're aware that from tonight, you've probably been condoning things or getting involved in things that aren't right for you. What do you do about that moving forward this week? I felt <clears throat> judged a lot of times in my life. And yet, it, I can't say I've Somehow, I'm, I, I don't think I've succeeded, but somehow you, one wants to keep one's eyes on Jesus. And if they judge me for the things they judge Jesus for, being a friend of sinners, being full of grace and mercy, being merciful, being compassionate, being generous, being gracious, then I've tried to go, well, Jesus... I'll take that in your name, but it's not easy. And then, and then trying to forgive and to say, I need to let go of that judgment. And I can't say, and just, you know, goes back to those things that we talked about forgiveness over the time that you say to God, Lord, I need to forgive this person, but I don't want to. Will you help me? And that's another miracle that God does of, of forgiving and just letting go and moving on. And I, I can't live the way people want me to live. I have to live the way Jesus wants me to live. But I can tell you it's been really hard at times. Really, really hard. So all I can say is you're not alone if you've been judged. You're not alone. And uh, the second part was if we feel we've been judgmental. What's the, what do we do about that? Mm. We, we come to Jesus and we ask for him. Is repentant. We repent. We ask for his grace. We ask him for the opportunities to live differently from now on. You can't change the past, but you can change the future. Mm. So you go, right, from now on, I'm going to live differently. And I've, I have definitely been judgmental and thrown stones. I've said to you before, over, you know, I keep a pile of stones in my office to remind me not to throw them, because mm. it's very easy. I think we are running out of time, aren't we? And we're going to sing just before we just before we finish. I've just got one th sort of question just f in my mind, and there's, there's loads of these questions that we haven't answered, so apologise for that because there is quite a few that we haven't got to. But I think we've answered most of them. So like iron sharpening iron, and you know what do we do if Christian leaders are leading people astray? Well, that's damaging people, isn't it? So we have to step in there and say something. Absolutely. Yeah. If it, it's if we need to protect people because somebody is misleading or hurting somebody else, we do need to get step in. Yeah. Do, do you think there's a, not a percentage, but do you think it's helpful for us to aim as Christians as having a certain amount of relationships with non-Christian people as well as church folk? Oh, totally. Obviously there are, but where would you try and strike the balance with that, I suppose, is what I'm saying? Because... Some people might say, well, I'm feeling really kind of like on my own because I've got lots of non-Christian friends, but I feel like I've got no support. Some people might be like, well, I've, I'm, I struggle to find non-Christian friends because I'm at church all the time. What would you say to somebody that might say that? That's a brilliant question. I think uh, that is really, really important for us to be in the world. Really important. If the world is changing us unhealthily, and we realise we're not being distinctive. We are laughing all the time what we shouldn't laugh. That's the moment to say, I need a few more Christian friends. Not to withdraw from all the non-Christian friends, but if they are 
if we are being corrupted by the world, but my prayer is that all of you are strong in the world and you don't be corrupted by it. I think that if we have no friends who aren't Christians, something's gone badly wrong. Something's gone badly wrong. And we need to join a club. <laughs> yeah, I suppose practically. We need to get out, get, we need to talk to, stuff, to talk to our next door neighbour. Yeah. We need to... Yeah. Um, I, became, I, I was really... I mean, it's really bad for me. This is my job is dealing with all you guys. Um, <laughs> so that's why I wanted to be a school governor. Mm. I found it really difficult the first time. I'm now chair of governors. It's so hard. I want to close in prayer every meeting. And I, know, I must, because <laughs> we don't close. You don't close in prayer. <laughs> well, it's just in my instinct. I'm leading this meeting. Let's close in prayer. But I don't say it. But sometimes I joke. I said, I'm, I'm not, I felt like closing in prayer, but I'm not going to do that. Mm. I wanted to be a governor because I needed to be out there. I got involved with the, 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 the Muslim community because I wanted to, to be out there. Mm. Great. I think we need to finish there because we're running over on time, aren't we? And there is questions. I mean, people can come and chat, can't they, and, mm -hmm. and ask questions. So apologies if we haven't answered the specific questions. Um, Do you want to pray? Yeah, should we pray together? Let's pray. Uh, yeah, Father God, I pray that you would help us love people like you do. That you would help us turn away from judgment. You would help us turn away from... Uh, perhaps just trying to make ourselves feel better by putting other people down, that you would help us turn away from uh, laughing when we shouldn't. You would help us turn away from, um, yeah, harsh words when you would want us to speak words of your truth and your love. Would you help us do that by your Holy Spirit? Would you help us stand up uh, and be courageous when there are people around us who are being hurt, Lord, would you give us the strength and the boldness to yeah, be strong for you and for those people in those scenarios? Lord, would you strengthen us where we're weak, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.